All right. So moving forward from here, we're going to have less general stuff about America as a whole, and a lot more of this is going to be really specific to Pennsylvania. Uh, partially because we just know so much more, uh, because the population of Pennsylvania is already, by the turn of the century, kind of 9 million people, or sort of treble the population of all of Wales. And uh, there comes a point at which it deserves really focused attention just in and of itself. Uh, as was kind of hinted at in the last lecture when Dr. Hall was talking, or in the last seminar when Dr. Hall was talking about the difference between, say, the development of railways in the south versus the development of the railways in Pennsylvania, there are different social and economic trajectories. Those different social and economic trajectories actually continue to diverge right into the 20th century. It's only in the back half of the 20th century that we get something that looks more like a kind of amalgamation of the various economies of various states in America. So Pennsylvania is quite particular. It's also really particular with reference to its political trajectory. Uh, in part because of the experiences of civil war. Following the civil war where Pennsylvania identifies strongly with Lincoln and the Republican Party and the abolitionist movement, uh, what you find is that the de position of the Democratic Party in Pennsylvania is virtually untenable following the civil war uh, where Democrats associated with the South, people who are in favor of slavery, the people who shot your relatives if you're uh, in Pennsylvania, and you've lived through the war. Now, all of this leads to, again, quite a unique circumstance whereby Pennsylvania effectively is one political party throughout the back half of the 19th, well into the 20th century. And because it, it's a state with only one party, essentially who wins the nomination for that party inevitably wins the competition against the beleaguered uh, Democratic Party, which is associated with uh, white supremacy and all kinds of nasty stuff after the war. And that remains the case right up into the 1920s. So effectively, control of the party in the state gives you control of the state, almost from top to bottom. So these gentlemen across here, uh, Simon Cameron, uh, Matt Key, and Boris Penrose, these are people which, by and large, hold relatively small, insignificant uh, political uh, positions. There are senators for the state of Pennsylvania and the U.S. Congress, for example, one of two the state of Pennsylvania. However, because they are the, the de facto or explicit head of the Republican Party in Pennsylvania, they essentially run the entire mistake, and they run it more or less as a mafia. And this, the term for this in, in Pennsylvania history is the machine. So this whole lecture is about the machine, the mechanism by which Cameron becomes uh, essentially the, the controller of politics in the state of Pennsylvania. And again, you know, we're talking about the government and politics of a, a state which conceives of itself even then in the 20s, it, pretty much in the way in which a state within the European Union would conceive of itself in terms of sovereignty right now. And that's a state of between 8 and 10 million people. So it's a really significant population over a long period of time, essentially run through a mafia-type system. So how do we get here, basically? And I, if I've been I'm not disingenuous, but maybe a little bit wrong-headed calling this post-pacifist politics, because as Dr. Hall has expressed, the Quakers, with their pacifist ideals, have really lost power uh, by the end of the 18th century. So by the mid-19th century and the end of the Civil War, we're really in new territory here. Uh, we're a generation post-pacifist politics, really. Uh, from the 1860s to the 1960s, the Democratic Party is the party of slavery and succession in the minds of Pennsylvania voters. Pennsylvania uh, pays a large price for its participation in the war. It sees economic advantage from producing war materials, but there are also a lot of dead. Uh, and people remember that. If we look at the 1860 election results, uh, here we have the, the candidates here, and by 1860, Northern, the Democratic Party was hived in half between Northern Democrats who were trying to be more, a bit more conciliatory and Southern Democrats who were pro-slavery, uh, pro pro-small uh, federal government, among other things. And you can see that uh, Abraham Lincoln is a Republican. Uh, these are the Pennsylvania, where are we at here? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania state results here. Lincoln polls 268,000 
uh, which is a sizable, uh, a sizable chunk of the vote, which you can see is otherwise divided between these uh, other parties. It is majority, actually, I think, if you add all that up there. Uh, from Lincoln's election forward, Pennsylvania becomes a Republican state. There is uh, abolitionist sentiment is more common than, uh, than the kind of uh, let it be camp, if you would. There are a lot of economic objections uh, to slavery. Of course, Pennsylvania smallholders and farmers have a constant fear they won't be able to, to compete with slave labor. And in fact, there are even kind of rumors among industrialists and industrial workers that if uh, slavery uh, ever comes into an industrialized form in the South, then you'll all lose your job because uh, slave drivers will be making people run foundries in the South. That's totally unfounded. Uh, the South wasn't prepared to engage in that kind of economic output, but these rumors bound. Uh, during the war, nearly a fifth of men in the Union Army are Pennsylvanians. Nearly a fifth. But if you think at that time America essentially stopped at the Mississippi, Pennsylvania and New York are far and away the biggest states in the Union. Even by the 1860s, New York had surpassed Pennsylvania. Indeed, New York City had surpassed uh, Philadelphia in population. But it's really those two that comprise the biggest chunk of the Union. Uh, Pennsylvania contributes more black soldiers, 8,612, than any other state forming 11 regiments. And there are only, uh, in 1870, 15,000 uh, uh, African Americans living in, in Pennsylvania full stop, which says that something like half of them would be people who served in Pennsylvania regiments. But the reality is that there's probably a kind of conveyor belt here where uh, people are coming into Pennsylvania, quite possibly ex slaves in the south, joining the army in Pennsylvania, which is on the border with the South, and then going South to fight again. Uh, Gettysburg, the decisive battle of the Civil War, sees 23,000 dead, wounded, and missing, and this happens on Pennsylvania soil. And then there, of course, are a whole series of smaller battles whilst two large armies move uh, back and forth around South Central Pennsylvania, preceding and succeeding uh, the Battle of Gettysburg. So, the pacifist, Quaker, self-image, if there's anybody left in Pennsylvania who thought Pennsylvania was all about being uh, pacifists and uh, perfect quality and so forth, these people are really out of the picture by now. 360,000 people in Pennsylvania served at war. 33,000 died. That's 9.2% of all Union deaths were Pennsylvanians. 12% uh, of all Medal of Honor recipients, 187 of them, are from Pennsylvania. That's the uh, equivalent of Victoria Cross. Uh, Pennsylvanians are really scarred by the war, which they associate with the Democratic Party. Uh, the Democratic Party was an anti-war party in the North who wanted to leave the South be. They were an anti-abolition party, which of course uh, moralistically makes them pro-slavery, right? Uh, and so really northern victory in the war de destroys the de Democratic Party. Even with that split between northern and southern Democrats, so-called northern Democrats are still an anti-war party who, who want to settle with the South and accept uh, that America is going to be divided too. Uh, so because they've hinged their, they've uh, leveraged their political position against the probability as they saw it that uh, a peace settlement would have to be reached between North and South, their party is effectively destroyed. Pennsylvania then, for the next 40 years, has a, a legacy of war hero politicians. And that really defines the self-image of the controlling Republican Party, who, of course, had been, uh, by and large, behind Lincoln and pro-abolitionist. So the Pennsylvania's governor uh, through the war is Andrew Gregg Curtin, and his great political rival is this chap down here, Simon Cameron, Cameron, who, as I already mentioned, will be the first leader of the so-called machine, uh, whereby the Republican Party controls the state. And we'll, we'll talk over the next 10 minutes or so about the rise of the machine and how really you would expect the governor of the state, essentially the president of the, of the state, the uh, inheritor of the old uh, colonial governorship, really, you would expect this chief executive of the state to be able to control the party within the state. 
But in fact, there's a power struggle emerges between Governor Curtin and Cameron. Curtin organized a state militia during the war. He built Camp Curtin near Harrisburg with 300,000 men are trained. Uh, but the Republican Party won by only uh, 15,000 votes among 500,000 votes cast uh, in the election for governor back in 1861. And so when it comes to uh, governorship, there was more tepid support for the Republican governor than there had been for the Republican presidential candidate, Lincoln. Uh, Curtin's not a particularly well-liked chap. He's seen as a kind of uh, straight-up party guy. Uh, he's not particularly creative. He's not perceived to be. He's not a bombast like some 19th century po politicians. He's very moderate. Uh, he's referred to as a soldier's friend because when uh, the re-election vote comes in the end of 63 to see who will be government governor in 64 forward, keep in mind governors are elected for three years at a time at this period, uh, he furloughs all of the soldiers so they can go home and vote. They've all been trained in Camp Curtin. He can see he's in danger of losing the, uh, uh, losing the election. We're in the middle of the war. The anti-war Northern Democrats are fe fielding a candidate against them. It looks like the war might go horribly wrong. So he lets all the soldiers go home and have a break from fighting so they can vote. And a lot of them vote for him, and, he, and he's vote, voted back in. Now, his chief rival is Simon Cameron. Uh, Curtin had a long feud with him. Uh, Cameron had been a Democratic senator for Pennsylvania from 45 to 49. He joined uh, the so-called Know Nothing Party, which uh, uh, Dr. Hall mentioned last week, which is this anti-Catholic, anti-immigration party, uh, who at the same time were trying to separate themselves from the uh, uh, soon-to-crash-out Democratic Party, uh, and on the other hand, uh, didn't really want to be too outspoken about their quite nasty anti-Catholic, uh, anti-immigration views. And so they would say, when you ask what their policy is, of course, as Dr. Hall said, I know nothing. He then becomes uh, a Republican in 1856 in opposition to the Dred Scott decision of 1857. Uh, the Dred Scott decision is very important in American history because it held that men whose ancestors were imported to the U.S. as slaves, could never be citizens. And this actually has a knock-on effect uh, because in some states, northern states, uh, in Pennsylvania, there was a long history of free blacks in Pennsylvania being able to vote as full citizens. Well, the Dred Scott decision, which is a national decision, uh, it takes it strips that right away. And so it's very important. Uh, and it, it is really, it's very much a... Uh, uh, anti-abolitionist de decision in every way conceivable. And so this pushes him to become a Republican, or at least that's the reason he gives. Some say that he's re very kind of, very much a political animal who sees which way the wind is blowing and goes with it. Okay. Now, he's, he's uh, out of favor from 1861 uh, because... Uh, of course, he, he opposes Greg. Greg gets the nomination, and Greg wins the governorship. <coughs> uh, Cameron is then sent to Russia as U.S. ambassador to Russia. In eight, uh, and he's out of favor. But then he comes back again in 18, later in 1861. He's only in Russia for but as long as it takes him to get there and come back again. Uh, he comes back, and he's appointed Lincoln's Secretary of War. He's very much, you know, he's in the corridors of power. You know, he's uh, no longer Pennsylvania senator from the election of 61, so he wrangles his job as U.S. ambassador to Russia. Uh, and, of course, northern states are trying desperately to keep foreign powers from recognizing the uh, Confederacy in the South as a country. So he, he gets there, and he comes straight back again, and Lincoln makes him War Secretary and he's arguably, from the point he becomes war secretary, the first quote-unquote boss of Pennsylvania politics. Because he has the capacity to determine where Lincoln spends his war money. He has a lot of say, in conjunction with Lincoln, over uh, what factories, what constituencies get those uh, contracts to, to make uh, cannon, to make bullets, to supply goods to the army. 
so on and so, so forth. Cameron and Curtin carry on their, their feud with one another. Uh, Cameron used the, uh, the cry of scandal to try and derail Governor Curtin, focusing on the Commutation Act of 1861. Curtin trying to get uh, industrialists on board with his uh, election campaign at a time when factory workers typically voted the way their bosses did because their bosses could check how they voted. Uh, he panders to the, the uh, industrialists uh, with the uh, Commutation Act of 1861, which repeals a tonnage tax on the Pennsylvania Railroad. And as I'll talk about in a couple lectures' time on the Pennsylvania Railroad, Pennsylvania Railroad is the fundamental link between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, the two great industrial centers of Pennsylvania. And if you're in Pittsburgh, you, have, uh, you live under an almost complete monopoly of the Pennsylvania Railroad whether you're a farmer trying to get your grain to market in a railway car or you're a factory worker being told your wages are going down because high railroad costs are, are hurting factory profits, you're really subject to the railroad uh, in all kinds of ways. Now, this sort of uh, tax, the state was charging the Pennsylvania Railroad, is taken away, but the railroad doesn't doesn't reduce its fees, it just pockets the profits. And in fact, its profits go up by an extra 650,000, which in today's money would be you know, 30 million a year, or something like this. The railroads hated in Allegheny County, which is that air, uh, the county around the city of Pittsburgh with all the West End heavy industry is. Uh, this leaves uh, farmers feeling hurt uh, that the state is letting the railroad, who they hate, get away with you know the uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, factory workers don't like this decision. It leaves a big hole in state finances, etc., etc. Now Cameron, uh, he has a kind of coup de coup d'état here, following the Democrat uh, 1962 white supremacist campaign in the state legislature. And this, again, during wartime, the 1862 campaign for uh, offices within the state legislature. The Democrats, Northern Democrats in Pennsylvania, say uh, if the Republicans win, there's going to be abolition in the South, and all of the ex slaves are going to come to Pennsylvania and take your jobs. And so they run uh, the first, what is a whole series of quote unquote white supremacist campaigns where the platform of the Democratic Party is uh, we are the party of the white man. I know it's hard to believe because today the Democratic Party is synonymous with the minority, and particularly the African American vote in Pennsylvania, but that's a, or and America, but that's a radical change based on developments in the 1960s. Uh, now, in, 19, in 1862, uh, Cameron's in the state legislature, which is evenly split between Democrats and Republicans. Uh, and there is one vacancy. So whichever party fills that one vacant seat is going to gain control of the state legislature and be able to dictate law going forward. Uh, Cameron's involved in a, a bribe. He tries to bribe Democratic officials to actually support uh, an internal vote to fill that seat with a Republican. He tries to bribe them to go against their party. In 1862, uh, he says, I'll give you some money, you vote for a Republican, and by the way, the Republican's going to be me. And this is how he tends to get back into, uh, uh, into government. Now, Governor Curtin re-wins election in 1863, despite all of this kind of hate campaign against him, and uh, despite all the bad press in the Commutation Act, and so forth. Uh, but he suffers ill health, and he's now faced with Cameron, who's back in a uh, position of power as an elected official. Uh, and Cameron effectively runs the state while Curtin is unwell by behind the scenes backroom dealing. Cameron begins to build the so-called machine as we, we know it now from the ground up, effectively controlling the state Republican Party when, uh, and when Gregg is replaced in 1867 by Governor John Geary uh, he has a huge say in who becomes the next nominee for Republican governor. And of course, 1867 election is after the war. 
the Democratic Party has been destroyed together with the Confederacy in the South. Abolition has, of course, happened, so there's no point in being an anti-abolitionist uh, par party. Uh, and so there's no real opposition to the next governor being a Republican, and Cameron effectively di dictates that Greg gets the nomination. So now we're really into the age of the machine here. So the uh, North, of course, wins the Civil War uh, under Republican leadership. Uh, the Democratic Party is uh, destroyed together with the Old South. There's no point, as I, I say, being an anti-abolitionist after abolition has happened and been secured in law. Uh, so the Democratic Party uh, really, in, in its kind of death throes, uh, turns to what effectively would be... Uh, uh, 50 years or 60 years thereafter of uh, white supremacist uh, platforms. Here on the right is a uh, uh, real campaign. This is an image of a real uh, campaign poster from the 1866 uh, gubernatorial uh, election. This is the Democratic Party here. Uh, and they, they, you notice how they, they've put a white man and a black man on the poster here. And uh, uh, under Geary, the Republican candidate here, uh, under his name, it says Geary's platform is for the Negro. Uh, and Clymer, he's the Democratic camp candidate here on the left, Clymer's platform is for the white man. Uh, read the platform. So what they're really trying to do here is, in a uh, not too subtle way, uh, for a really uneducated voter, perhaps even suggest that, that Geary uh, is black and that Clymer is white uh, in person as well as in uh spirit as they would see it. So really pretty shocking stuff. But this poster sums up the trajectory of the Democratic uh, Party uh, in Pennsylvania up until the 1930s. And of course, in the, the South, they stick with this kind of platform uh, right up to the, the 1960s. So uh, again, pretty shocking stuff there. But in the aftermath of the Civil War and the defeat of the Old South and the by extension, the destruction of the uh, Democratic Party, he who controls the <coughs> Republican Party, uh, the levers of power in the Republican Party in Pennsylvania, uh, control the state. Because even though elections will always feature two candidates, the Democratic opposition is so ineffective, uh, and their white supremacy campaigns uh, platform is so ineffective in the North, uh, you know, given that hundreds of thousands of Pennsylvanians have have fought in the Union Army against slavery and so forth, uh, they don't really have a, a, a snowball's chance uh, in Hades of uh, winning an election. Uh, the best they can do is these kind of scaremongering tactics where they say, if, if, you, if you vote in Republicans, they'll empower blacks and the blacks will take your job. Uh, you know, it's a pretty dreadful stuff there. So we, we leave the... Uh, Democratic uh, Party is stern in its, its white supremacist platform, and I'll, we push on to look at the Republicans here a little bit. And uh, I want to point out that, that Cameron, as the first boss of the machine, he really grasps the importance the way previous politicians had failed to do. Uh, he really grasps the importance of controlling the Republican state convention, because the party convention... Uh, of the Commonwealth or state is where they choose candidates. And if you can be influential in orchestrating which candidate is chosen for the Republican Party, then that person is almost guaranteed to get into uh, office because the Democratic uh, opposition is so uh, kind of uh, weak uh, and uh, uh, racist. So controlling the uh, state convention requires controlling county conventions, which uh, uh, nominate the uh, uh, persons to go off and represent the various counties at the state convention. And below that, to control ward conventions. Uh, wards are uh, areas within larger cities, such as Philadelphia, and in some places there are areas within counties, uh, which uh, at the lowest level... Uh, select representatives uh, to go off to the county convention uh, and then uh, so forth. County convention representatives are chosen to go off to the state convention. So you're working backwards here from the top down to the grassroots here. And Cameron understands that if you can influence people down at the ward level, then, then you can get your people in influential positions at the county level who will uh, 
then send off people favorable to your views to the state convention, and whomever you choose as a candidate there will almost invariably win the election. No one could be nominated for state or federal elected uh, positions in Pennsylvania without the approval of the conventions, and Cameron manipulates uh, the conventions. He does this uh, partially uh, through his legacy as a uh, Lincoln's war secretary, where, war secretary, we made a lot of associations with various businesses and suppliers of goods to the army. Uh, but he extends that to through kind of congenial personal relationships and other aspects of, of control, indirect control. Uh, the important thing to remember is that uh, we operate on the spoils system uh, in Pennsylvania. Indeed, the U.S. federal government still operates in what's called the spoils system. Uh, this is to say that uh, once you're in power, you can uh, off you can uh, fill all of the cabinet positions with uh, appointees of your liking. Uh, you can extend that down to county offices, sometimes even ward or city offices. You can arbitrarily appoint people to hold those uh, government positions uh, uh, willy nilly. So. Uh, in the same way that there's there's much fuss now about whether, for example, uh, President Donald Trump could reasonably have have uh, dismissed the former director of the FBI, James Comey, because he just felt like it. Well, actually, he could. That's part. That's an ingrained part of the so-called spoil system. You take that uh, at the state level and extend that from the governor's office right down to individual wards, and there are thousands of people who can be arbitrarily. Uh, uh, appointed, or there are thousands of offices, I should say, to which you can arbitrarily appoint people. So uh, if you come into power and you're Republican, you can uh, uh, fire all the Democratic uh, office holders or administrators throughout the Commonwealth to replace them with Republicans. Also, what you can do is uh, offer uh, grants or contracts uh, to various businesses on behalf of the Commonwealth in this period with almost no oversight. For example, even county, ward, and township jobs are granted as spoils. Uh, there are probably about 25,000 jobs across the state uh, that are handed out on the spoils system. And so uh, if you imagine this at a time when there are families, a family is uh, comprised, say, of, of five people, uh, and there's only one worker, so 25,000 uh, spoils jobs support a population of 125,000 people. When it comes election time, all Cameron has to do is, is make it known that uh, if you want to keep your job, you need to support candidate X at the ward or county level, and you get 125,000 people uh, suddenly really motivated to go out and uh, speak to the electorate and make sure that that preferred candidate gets selected. Uh, the spoil system has partially gone with equality legislation uh, that stops you from sacking people at will uh, from uh, state jobs. And that came in in the 1950s, 60s, but, but elements of it are still there. Simon Cameron, he dies in 1889, having been very successful at, at dominating the Republican Party and uh, ensuring that almost every uh, representative to the federal government from Pennsylvania is Republican, and that most of the representatives in the state legislature are Republican uh, throughout his tenure, right up to 1889. Even though uh, he had ceased to be Lincoln's war secretary in 1862, uh, after the uh, the whole dodgy debacle whereby he re-enters elected office, uh, uh, as a uh, legislator, uh, he nevertheless remained uh, Lincoln's uh, de facto consultant on federal patronage after 1862. Uh, it's funny, uh, during that one year when he was Lincoln's war secretary from 1861 to 62, Lincoln famously said of him, this is a man so corrupt he'd steal everything but a hot stove. Uh, that was Lincoln's view on Cameron. But nevertheless, uh, Cameron could get things done, and Pennsylvania was the big manufacturing powerhouse of the, the Civil War era, and so uh, Lincoln needed a linkage between himself and uh, the manufacturers in Pennsylvania. And so even after Cameron ceases to be war secretary, he still controlled 
uh, indirectly who got a lot of big government contracts. And he used that, of course, to help influence uh, uh, influence people uh, within the Commonwealth and to govern the uh, spo you know, spoil system and so forth. Now, from 1867 to 73, Governor Geary, who was not that hot on Cameron's uh, almost dictatorial control of the Republican Party and therefore the state, uh, he resists Cameron uh, as well as he can. Uh, he vetoes 268 private bills uh, in this, the uh, Commonwealth legislature, uh, which had been designed as favors. So this is where they write a, a bill and say, uh, you know, let, let's... Uh, Let's create a few jobs, build a bridge in Bob's constituency. It just happens to be outside of Bob's manor, or excuse me, Bob's mansion house in, uh, you know, in the greater Philadelphia area. That, that's a kind of a private bill as a favor. Spending money in ways that are, are particularly helpful to a legislator's uh, business, for example. You might say uh, you know, Pennsylvania Senator X. Uh, you know, happens to own a business that does Y, if we were to build, say, some docks on the river just outside his factory, wouldn't that be good for everybody? Uh, and so you allocate some funds for that. That's a, a private bill that might have been used as a favor. As I say, Governor Geary vetoes 268 of these kind of private bills, uh, but over a thousand are passed anyway. And so Governor Geary tried to resist uh, Cameron to an extent, but he's not real successful. Now, uh, Cameron dies in 1889, and he's succeeded by Matthew Stanley Key, uh, this is pronounced Key, Q-U-A-Y, uh, as the second boss of the, the Republican machine in Pennsylvania. Key defects uh, from Curtin's, uh, you know, ex-Governor Curtin's sort of cadre of persons over to Cameron's uh, group of uh, uh, politicians in 1869, and he insinuates himself there and becomes part of the machine. By 1871, he's Cameron's lieutenant. Uh, this is uh, lieutenant in British pronunciation, but lieutenant in British and American pronunciation, of course. He becomes Cameron's lieutenant. Uh, that's an informal role, uh, something akin to party whip now. Uh, he then becomes treasurer uh, of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And so if, if, if one of the ways... Cameron governs the machine is by making sure that money is dispensed uh, to various projects and that the Commonwealth buys various things from certain persons. If you want to run the machine that way without uh, too much transparency, it's helpful to have your second in command acting as treasurer of the Commonwealth. Uh, Matt, Matthew Key becomes a U.S. Uh, senator, senator for Pennsylvania. So keep in mind here you have a state legislature and then, of course, you have a uh, representatives from Pennsylvania going off to the United States federal government, and there are two senators from each state in the United States federal government. Matthew Key becomes one of the two U.S. senators for Pennsylvania from 1887 to 1899, and again from 1901 uh, to 1904. Uh, there is a big treasury scandal uh, when he's, uh, or, excuse me, a big treasury uh, scandal uh, after he's a uh, treasurer, uh, the treasury scandal breaks in 1885, but it's about things that he did uh, back in the 1870s as treasurer of the Commonwealth. Uh, basically, he'd uh, uh, invested various uh, Commonwealth funds on Wall Street and, and various uh, various ways that, that weren't entirely transparent. Uh, a real long-term problem in pre-modern government is is keeping people who are in charge of holding funds from using them to their own advantage. So, for example, uh, if you were treasurer, imagine if we're in a world where money exists mostly in a sort of a physical form and it's a little harder to track. Imagine if you're a treasurer and you say, blimey, uh, you know, I could do everybody some good here if I took, if I borrowed a little money from the uh, uh, vault, I invested it in such a way that it, 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 it yields a good return, then I put it back and I... Uh, I personally take the uh, the dividend on that investment uh, for my own use. Well, th that uh, happens in a very opaque way. It's very hard to pin him down uh, as having done something entirely inappropriate, but he did uh, certainly spend 
certain amounts of money out of the treasury and various investments uh, that may not necessarily have been to the public good. Nevertheless, this doesn't destroy his career. Uh, he becomes uh, not only head of the Pennsylvania uh, Republican machine, he becomes chair of the United States Republican National Committee from 1888 to 91. So not only have the Republicans developed this machine mentality using the spoil system to maintain absolute political control in Pennsylvania, but they then extend that uh, to the head of the Pennsylvania Republican machine being head of the United States Republican National Committee. Uh, and uh, if you look here, it's Republican governors, of course, who, who succeed uh, Geary going forward. Uh, Governor John Hartrampt in office from 1873 to 79. He's Republican, of course. He's then followed by uh, Henry Hoyt from 79 to 83, who's a Republican, of course, uh, selected carefully by the machine and offered to voters in an election that he was that each of them was sure to win because the opposition is the white supremacist Democratic Party, which people still associate with the old slave-owning, uh, anti-abolitionist uh, Democratic South. In 1873, uh, it's decided that Pennsylvania should have a new constitution. And I put here at the top of this slide a link uh, uh, to a website where you can read the new constitution, uh, which is uh, ultimately approved in 1874. Now, uh, this is kind of a sop to complaints about the machine, but the, uh, the Republicans say, yes, yes, we do need reform, uh, but we're going to carefully manage that reform. And so whilst reform is supported by Republicans and Democrats, reform to the Commonwealth inevitably turns out to be uh, a better uh, certainly better for the Republicans and for the Democrats. Uh, this could have been an occasion to regulate the machine, to put in safeguards to stop the, the kind of machine politics, one-party politics of Pennsylvania, uh, and to stop Pennsylvania's notorious you know, corruption under, under the spoil system. But it turns out to be a missed opportunity. There's a constitutional convention called from uh, November of 12, 1872 to December of 1873. So it's a very long time. It's over a year it sits. There are a whole bunch of uh, delegates, uh, but most of them have business interests. Uh, for example, the Pennsylvania and Reading Railroads, a sugar refiner, uh, various uh, iron, mong iron manufacturers uh, have delegates at the constitutional convention. But uh, despite the fact that in this period, as you recall from a previous lecture, uh, even after the industrialization of the 1840s and 50s, four in 10 of all Pennsylvanians are farmers. 40% of Pennsylvanians remain farmers. But of all the delegates at the convention, only one is a farmer. He must speak. That one man had to speak for 40% of the population. Of course, his voice is drowned out. And there's no labor representation. So what we've got here are basically career politicians, uh, small and large businesses, and one farmer uh, with no labor representation. Uh, in this period, as I think I've mentioned before, uh, manufacturing workers tend to vote the way their boss does because uh, it used to be a matter of public record how you voted. You might vote in secret on the day, but later uh, you could validate the uh, vote rolls as a matter of transparency and see exactly how your workers had voted. And so people are always afraid to vote against the boss. Uh, that's to say their factory boss. But, uh, of course, uh, throughout the state, if you had a public uh, uh, public sector job, you were terrified to vote against the party boss uh, as well. As a result of the new constitution, the Pennsylvania House and uh, Pennsylvania Senate and the uh, the now bicameral uh, legislature of the Commonwealth uh, increased to 200 representatives and uh, 50 senators. Uh, in the House, people had hold uh, two-year terms. In the Senate, four-year terms. Elections are to be held biannually, uh, and districts uh, are to be of a similar population. The governorship is now to have a four-year term in imitation of the four-year presidential terms of the federal government. Uh, instead of the old three-year term. Now, this is Pennsylvania's third constitution. As you all know, there's the 1776 
Constitution and in the seven, uh, excuse me, uh, 1776 Constitution and then the uh, 1790 Constitution after that. Uh, so uh, not just shy of 100 years later, we get this uh, third Constitution. Now, other uh, things that are inserted into the new Constitution, uh, there's to be suffrage uh, for black Pennsylvanians. Uh, this is actually a return uh, of suffrage, as we'll talk about in a, a future lecture on the civil rights movement. Uh, of course, Pennsylvania had been very forward looking and uh, anyone who paid taxes in Pennsylvania uh, had been able to vote after the Gradual Abolition Act. And that means that there were black taxpaying voting Pennsylvanians up until the federal Dred Scott decision stripped them of the right to vote. Uh, this is now re-enshrined uh, in line, excuse me, re-enshrined in law in the 1874 Constitution. Uh, other, ter other aspects of the Constitution, there would be no amendments to alter a bill's purpose. Uh, this is uh, because there used to be a, a system of uh, creating a bill which would allocate some money for X, and then by the time it was actually passed, it had been altered so much that 10% uh, of the money went to X, but in fact, 90% of the money it allocated went to Y, something completely different. Uh, appropriation bills uh, on, uh, are to have only one clear purpose of expenditure. That's quite similar. Each bill is to receive three public readings uh, in the uh, legislature. All amendments are to be published before voting. What used to happen was they'd publish a bill, uh, the uh, sponsoring uh, legislators would then slip in some serious amendments, maybe changing uh, substantially what it would, it, what that new law would achieve, or what the financial ab, uh, allocation would achieve, and then run it back through for a final vote, uh, with people not understanding how it had been altered. Uh, bills uh, that allocate money for for local pet projects of 28 different kinds are to be banned in the future and 30 days notice is to be given to all uh, local areas of bills uh, that will affect uh, that particular local area and there is future to be in the future to be equal taxation on similar types of property throughout the state uh, which is uh, uh, something that hadn't previously occurred you might have a, a very similar um, farm or mansion house in Philadelphia uh, slash uh, Pittsburgh, but in the two localities of a different tax rate that's no longer allowed. Uh, and no uh, city commissions are allowed uh, to enter into debt uh, going forward. People have to have a balanced budget. Overall, the reforms are largely ineffective, though, and a gerrymandering, which is to say when you carefully construct electoral districts to ensure that one party uh, will have the majority will always have the majority in any given district. Uh, that's quite common. Uh, the, the way in which it's typically done is to say, if you had a Democratic enclave surrounded by three Republican neighborhoods, what you do is you draw the electoral district lines in such a way so that the Democratic vote is divided into three uh, small chunks, one put into each larger Republican district to ensure that the Republicans would always win uh, uh, seats. These are all products of having a one-party political system. Now, uh, there, I mean, we'll go. I'll go on to say more about the excesses, uh, you know, over the next few, sl few slides here. But it's in important to remember that uh, we still have one-party politics in a few uh, states in America now. The most famous example being, of course, California the most populous state in the union today with 30 million citizens living there. California has a one-party system with, uh, I think, something approaching 70% of Californians tending to vote dem Democrat uh, and over half of all registered voters there being Democrat. And it means that, as in Pennsylvania in the 19th and early 20th century, now in California, uh, there is no opposition and any old idea that they rep Democratic Party gets there, they ram through with all of the attendant outrageous corruption that we saw in Pennsylvania in the 1860s to 1960s, now being mirrored in California from the 1980s until now. So these problems don't go away, they keep coming back. Anyway, we'll soldier forward through time now. 
the machine begins to misfire with this big scandal. Uh, remember Key's uh, three-year absent, or sorry, Key decides he's going to leave politics for three years. Uh, I'd like to go back, but I can't. Shoot. I ruined the recording. Uh, he goes out of politics, and I think he comes back again in 1904. Oh, test my memory here. Because he thinks he's going to retire. The problem is, once he retires, the wheels come off. Uh, there's big divisions in, within the Republican Party about who, sh who should be nominated here or there. Uh, people make poor decisions and nominate candidates as favors where the candidate is somebody totally unelectable. And we end up with a Democratic governor, uh, Governor Patterson in 1883 to 87, the first Democratic governor since 1861. Now, uh, Key then re-enters politics. Oh, I guess, sorry, it's 1887. He comes back. Key then re-enters politics, uh, takes the reins of the party again, and orchestrates the election of uh, Governor James Beaver in 1887 to 91. Worryingly in the background for this machine which revolves in industrial support, th this is the sort of the beginning of the era of what we call progressive politics, where politicians start responding to the desire of people for universal education, universal uh, clean water, universal uh, public health, etc. The election of Beaver responds in a way to the Johnston flood. I'll come back to this in a couple of lectures, but it's a huge uh, disaster in Pennsylvania history. There's been clear cutting of forest. Water rushes down into an artificial lake, which has been built as a pleasure reserve for rich Pittsburgh industrialists. Unfortunately, it's positioned above the town of Johnst Johnston, a major industrial town. Uh, water from uh, the unwisely deforested hillsides flood the lake, the dam bursts, uh, thousands of people die as the town is effectively washed away. Uh, there's a flood relief commission set up under uh, General Daniel Hastings, and this creates forest reserves to stop excessive logging. And this happens under James, under James Beaver. And everybody comes to know who Hastings is. The problem is Key, so Key doesn't like Hastings for personal reasons. Remember, this is a, gov a government of sort of, a, the, even at this time period, 7 million people being run like a mafia. Key doesn't like Hastings, so he denies him the party nom nom nomination. And as a, a protest vote, a lot of people go out and vote Democrat. Because the Democrats are finally waking up to the idea that maybe focusing on helping people rather than focusing on a uh, white supremacist platform is a sensible way to get back into power. So Governor Robert Patterson, uh, we out here. He wins a second term. Yeah, he wins a, a second term, but it, he's embattled. In 1894, Key nominates Daniel Hastings. Yeah, uh, the uh, hero of the Johnson Flood. Uh, and he comes into governorship from 1895 to 1899. Now, after Key dies, he's succeeded by the last of the sort of bosses of the machine, a guy named Boise Penrose, and he has to contend with this whole rising issue of progressivism. Remember I said there's, you know, there's discontent uh, among a lot of people because progressive politics, the idea of policies where the state should work to help the ordinary person, that that's on the rise by the turn of the century. Uh, and how Key represents an old guard who is very much in league with industrialists. Well, Boise Penrose, he, he realizes that he needs to get on board with some of this progressive stuff if he's going to keep the Republican machine intact. Now, after the Hastings debacle, uh, where Hastings had slipped in, a, slipped in as a Democratic governor, because be, uh, slipped in as a Democratic governor, Pennsylvania under uh, Key and Penrose's, uh, excuse me, Key and Penrose's leadership sees back to pack Republican governors from 1895 to 1935. It's 
to 40 years, another 40 years of unbroken uh, Republican leadership. Governor Georgie, early in 1935-39, represents a Depression-era popular rebellion against the status quo. And he is the first Democrat, where are we at here? Uh, he's the first Democrat to be elected after 1895. So solid Republicans, 95 to 35. Then Georgie early gets in there capitalizing on these progressive ideas uh, during the Depression, saying let's help ordinary people rather than maintaining the status quo. Now Boise Penrose is the third so-called boss. At this point, being boss of the Republican Party and running the spoil system and the state government has become such a big job that you need almost a kind of professional manager. He's like CEO of a state. Uh, he's ultra wealthy. He's an aristocrat. He takes over the Cameron Key machine in 1904 and controls it until his death in 1921. He's a Philadelphian. He's descended from Lord Baltimore, the English lord who founded the colony of Maryland uh, back in 15, back in uh, a 1579 to 32. That's Baltimore's lifespan. When, when was Maryland uh, colony founded? I know this, is, this isn't your patch. Um, I think it was 16, mm. 16, 16, uh, 1631. Was 16, it must have been just before Lord Baltimore's death. Yeah, that's my memory. Paul, Paul I'm putting you on the spot there in front yes, of he, He's a graduate of Harvard, which he by now is established as the premier elite university of America. And he once said, and I love this quote, there's loads of great Penrose quotes, and he's a socially awkward man, you know. He says, I propose to stay a senator. This is to say a senator representing the state of Pennsylvania in the national federal government, which really, in terms of state politics, is a small job. He says, I propose to stay a senator. I want power. It's the only thing for which I care. I have it. I shall keep it. There are about 5,000 election divisions in this state. Uh, to, hold from, uh, to hold from 20,000 to 25,000 Republican workers who carry the division and bring out the vote. I must know all of these men. They must know me. The interests of the state? Question mark. Of course I look after those. But the job is managing and knowing the men who bring out the election division. That is to say, the job is running the machine. Yeah, of course I look after the state. Yeah, whatever. But running the machine, that's what... Well, there, there are two machines uh, on a, a smaller scale. There's a, a city machine in Philadelphia and a city machine in, in uh, Pittsburgh. And these kind of mirror the same sort of structure and tactics of, of the, the Commonwealth-wide machine of government. So it's, it's all about uh, pre-approved candidates and backroom dealing. Now, uh, Philadelphia's own machine by Boise Penrose's day is run by a, a pair of brothers, the so-called Vare brothers, George and Edwin Vare, uh, and a third brother, William Vare. They're sometimes uh, referred to uh, as uh, vote racketeers. Uh, and they have various ways of manipulating the, the government of the, the city of Philadelphia. Uh, one way they do this is to introduce the so-called bullet charter uh adopted in 1 June 1885, which empowers the mayor to act as chief executive to disempower corrupt officials. So just like with the new uh, uh, Commonwealth uh, Constitution of 1874, which looked like it was about reform, but actually ends up entrenching the machine, this too is made to look like it's about uh, municipal reform, but really ends up entrenching the machine. It's ineffective. It does nothing to diminish the underlying machine because, of course, if the mayor himself is a, a part of the machine, then is he really going to disempower any uh, officials in the city that are, are part of his same machine? Instead, he's just going to use his capacity to sack officials who don't agree with him to keep uh, other city officials in line. Uh, it's sort of like making the, uh, uh, well, I was going to use a poacher gamekeeper analogy there, but it's, just, it's not quite right here. Uh, it's like putting the fox in charge of the hen house, something like that. Uh, a series of scandals uh, follow this. Uh, maybe the most famous is the so-called great gas steal 
and uh, scandals like the Great, great Gas Steel, steel start to come to light in uh, Pennsylvania and elsewhere in the U.S. due to the emergence of investiga investigative journalism, which at the time was called so-called muckraking uh, journalism, which exposes to the public eye uh, various corrupt practices. And there's nowhere more uh, corrupt than the one-party uh, state of Pennsylvania at the stage. So in the Great Gas Steel, uh, I'll give you a little bit of backstory here. In 1897, Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Municipal Gas Works was leased to the United Gas Improvement Company for 30 years with rights to self-regulate gas quality and prices. And I, I've underlined that and put it in bold for a reason. Because if you're uh, paying, as they do, a single flat rate payment to the city to run the gas works, but you have complete autonomy to self-regulate quality and prices, well, of course, you're going to run down quality and increase prices to maximize your profit margin, aren't you? Now, if that weren't bad enough, what happens in 1907 is the uh, uh, much-hated uh, United Gas Improvement Company seeks the right to extend its lease to 1980. So it is at 73 years more for a set payment of 25 million a year. And of course, they know well that you have annual inflation and that by the time you reached even the 1950s, that the uh, city would be receiving pennies uh, in exchange for a, uh, uh, a major municipal, uh, uh, major, major municipal uh, lease where, again, the United Gas Improvement Company was to have uh, a complete control to self-regulate quality and, and prices, effectively excluding, legally excluding city authorities from regulating them. Uh, this is, I mean, this is crazy. Uh, there are mass city meetings. Uh, the press gets, you know, organizes the community to come forth uh, and protest this. And Mayor John Weaver, who, uh, it, whilst... Uh, not the head of the machine, the Ver brothers, the head of the machine. He's he's a major player in the machine and a product of it. He himself has to have a massive public climb down and veto uh, veto the uh, lease of the uh, gas works. Now, Boise Penrose as a uh, Boise Penrose as uh, boss of the Commonwealth level. Uh, Pennsylvania machine, he steps in because there's level, there are levels of corruption. There's, there's, yeah, there's a bit of corruption of backroom dealing, and then there's this kind of holy heck corruption, uh, which has made it into the national news and led to a very public climb down by Republican machine mayor uh, John Weaver. And so Boise Penrose gets directly involved and uh, prompts uh, city authorities to introduce uh, yet another. Uh, city charter. Uh, this one in 1919, uh, which again is supposed to uh, clean up corruption. And, and Penrose, uh, he feels he has to get on board with uh, supporting a certain degree of, of progressive uh, anti-corruption uh, legislation just to kind of redeem the, the respectability to some extent of the uh, Republican Party and the machine. Uh, so he supports this new charter and uh, the charter gets rid of the old double chamber government of Philadelphia. When the government of Philadelphia had been set out, uh, you know, as a century and more before, it kind of imagined Philadelphia as a as a kind of mini London, as a kind of uh, head of a of a of a of a growing, you know, effectively the head of a growing. Uh, nation almost, where Philadelphia would would sort of rule over. Uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, definitely. But as we'll talk about in a minute, that, that doesn't happen because a, a separate state, or I should say Commonwealth government, had formed up with its own legislature. And so you end up with this kind of uh, a marooned, heavy-duty, a double-chamber, 146-member legislature, uh, which originally was designed to govern all of the Commonwealth, but is only governing the city of Philadelphia. Moreover, the 146 members are unpaid persons who, who supposedly are wealthy, uh, good citizens in a kind of old-fashioned Quaker way, considering themselves all equals to other common men and governing uh, uh, out of the goodness of their own heart. Instead, in reality, by this period, they had become persons who made their living 
in the absence of a regular paycheck by accepting various bribes and taking all kinds of kickbacks uh, uh, with respect to their uh, legislative role in the overblown uh, municipal government of Philadelphia. Now, the 1919 Charter replaces that huge apparatus uh, with a, uh, a city council made up of councilmen and on an annual salary. And the idea is that if you're paying the councilmen an annual salary, then they don't need to rely on bribes and kickbacks uh, in, in order to get by and you'll have less corruption. It's tricky to know that quite the result of this. Uh, of course, even if you're receiving a salary in a place where there's a culture of, of bribes and kickbacks, you, you're probably going to think, well, I could still have a bit more money, couldn't I? Also, there's an argument that with only a narrow group of councilmen to look after, the machine could more effectively manipulate the city government than it could when it had to, to wrestle with 146 members of a, of a municipal legislature. If we go to look at the, the Pittsburgh machine now, uh, in Pittsburgh, it's Christopher McGee and uh, William Flynn who are the men who run the machine in Pittsburgh, the other uh, great city of Pennsylvania. Christopher McGee uh, builds up a uh, the so-called Consolidated Traction Company running city trams, and th this is how he gets rich. Now, he, he leaves a, a kind of rich uh, uh, philanthropic inheritance to the city of Pittsburgh even today. Christopher, Christopher McGee uh, founded the city zoo, for example, in 1895, uh, with 125,000 pounds, which today would be something more like 12.5 million. Uh, McGee and Flynn, uh, whilst they are Republicans, they are from a faction of Republicans who are enemies of Matthew Key, that kind of middle a boss of the machine. Uh, and uh, they kind of run a, a kind of distiff side of the, of, the of the Republican machine out in Pittsburgh. In 1887, they uh, had orchestrated a new city charter uh, remo and removed appointment power from the city council and given it to uh, a uh, department to department heads. So they set up various depart department of sanitation, department of transport, uh, and uh, of course those people, you know, in reality uh, are actually easier to corrupt as individuals. Uh, than the old uh, uh, city, than the old city council, which was a, a more diverse group, and so they they reform uh, and so-called you know pretend to modernize uh, the municipal government in Pittsburgh by having departments with department heads uh, rather than just a council uh, that allocates money for everything under the sun. But the reality is that then allows them to isolate and corrupt uh, the heads of various departments. Christopher McGee dies in 1901. Uh, and William Flynn uh, carries on running uh, the machine uh, up until 1903. Uh, Flynn's a, a slightly different character. He he was an Irish immigrant, and he uh, he quote unquote won uh, through bidding uh, most construction and paving contracts in Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania. The reality is, though, he he won uh, those uh, construction contracts in an environment where the, the various bids weren't made publicly known and uh, you could effectively just say, oh, X, person X had the low bid, uh, you know, and give them the job. And, and so it's really through, through kind of construct, you know, uh, corruption that he gets very rich and then he reinvests that money in, in uh, being part of the machine and uh, part of the corruption problem in, in, in Pittsburgh and, and of course, he then gets directly involved in in allocating monies for various uh, municipal works and construction projects to other uh, persons in the machine that he wants beholden to him. Uh, he's subject of, a, of an entire book in 1903 by one of the early muckraker investigative journalists of the day, uh, Lawrence Steffens, uh, who whose book uh, "The Shame of the Cities" is a kind of classic on municipal uh, corruption. Now, uh, in fact, uh, uh, once McGee and Flynn are gone, it's uh, uh, Tom Bigelow who becomes the new boss of Pittsburgh. He's McGee's cousin, and he'd been helped up through the ranks of municipal government uh, and the circles of power by uh, Christopher McGee. 
Uh, Bigelow's uh, boss in Pittsburgh from 1903. He, originally, he was a reformer, a part of the so-called Citizens Party, uh, but he worked to take over the, the McGee-Flynn uh, machine. As always happens, uh, people use the, the uh, battle cry of reform as cover to, in fact, uh, get on the inside, if you would, so that they can... Uh, they can run the machine themselves. He's involved in the big sewage scandal. This is a big scandal in Pittsburgh. Uh, so it's a great gas deal in Philadelphia, but the contemporary scandal of Pittsburgh is a sewage scandal. In 1896, the Filtration Commission under uh, uh, under E.M. Bigelow, who's uh, Tom's brother, uh, who's acting as director of public works at the time, recommends a sand filtration system for the... Uh, disposing of, of the city sewage. Uh, Bigelow and Flynn uh, both wanted the contract, and, and here we have uh, Bigelow who took over from McGee falling foul of Flynn. Uh, McGee had run against Matthew Key for Senate, and uh, Tom uh, Bigelow had pitched, and so the, the old disagreement between the McGee and uh, Key within the Republican Party uh, comes to the fore here because, uh, as I say, uh, uh, Biglow had pitched for Key. Flynn uh, uh, got cast. Eventually, Flynn manages to sort of come back from the dead, if you were, and, and, and get Councilman to sack, uh, sack Biglow as director of public works. Of course, this makes his brother Tom, as running the machine, very angry. Uh, and a year later, Biglow uh, gets his job back and sacks Flynn's engineers. But by that time, the plant's construction. Uh, is seriously delayed and only really begins in 1905. Uh, and by then, at least 1,538 people are thought to have died as, of typhoid as a result of not having a, a proper sanitation system in place. So there's a downside of the machine for you there. Now, I'm going to give you here some pictures of the uh, 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 Commonwealth uh, government buildings, I want you to see how vast and beautiful these are, uh, because these relate to uh, probably the biggest scandal of all in Commonwealth history, the scandal uh, regarding the expenses of building this uh, massive complex, which looks a little bit like, uh, I don't know, a mixture between Versailles and the U.S. Capitol building, <laughs> with its lovely gardens and uh, so forth. Uh, Pennsylvania probably has the most over-the-top, overblown beautifully artistic uh, capital of any state in the Union. So uh, how does the Capitol scandal come about? Well, the old Capitol building, which you see depicted in the top right here on a long uh, out-of-copyright uh, uh, postcard, it burns down on the 2nd uh, on the uh, 2nd of... Excuse me. It burns down on the, the 2nd of February, 1897. Now, in 1901, the legislature's uh, commission, uh, which is trying to decide what to do about these, this problem of not having a proper capital building, uh, in 1901, the legislature's uh, commission allocates $4 million to rebuild the capital. Uh, they uh, seek out the uh, uh, work of uh, Joseph uh, Houston of Philadelphia, who was a prominent architect at the time, to, to sort of draw up a plan uh, you know, his uh, designs are approved. Uh, the Board of Public Grounds and Buildings uh, under Governor uh, Penny Packer, the Auditor General, uh, State Treasurer, uh, they uh, unilaterally approve $7.7 million uh, worth of decorations uh, for this uh, $4, million, uh, $4 million new capital. So what you have is the legislature allocates four million for something, but a a sort of internal uh, governor-led uh, uh, committee approves an additional seven point seven million. Uh, Houston was on on both uh, the commission and the board, and so there's an incredible conflict of interest there. Uh, so you have an architect who's designing the building on the commission that votes whether or not to approve the design. And then you also have the same architect on the uh, uh, board, which decides whether or not to spend various monies on various kinds of decorations. And so the architect really gets his way here, gets his cake and eats it too. 
In August 1907, the building is publicly announced as finished and on budget at $4 million. Well, uh, it may be that the, the structural works were nearly on budget, but that leaves out the 7.7 uh, .7 in decorations plus all the other cost overruns. In fact, an investigation finds the total cost of the new capital to have been $13 million, uh, with $5 million of that having been lost to corruption. And here's the example here. Uh, you, what you say is, a, let, let me show you a, a chair that we're going to have in uh, uh, one of the rooms for legislators to sit in. Isn't that a lovely chair? Okay. Well, let's charge you $1,000 a chair, even though we would normally sell them at you know, $100 a chair. And then the extra... Nine hundred dollars. Well, that just goes into the pocket of the pockets of the people who approve the contract and uh, uh, his cronies at, at the manufactory, so forth. So, as a result of of this uh, corruption, you can see the way in which uh, uh, a four million dollar rebuild becomes a thirteen million dollar uh, capital, which is uh, just absolutely over the top. If, if you ever go to uh, uh, Harrisburg to see the uh, capital uh, of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, you will find that it is it is arguably you know more extensive, more beautiful, more grandiose uh, than the uh, capital of the United States. And I'll offer you just a few more images here to back that up. So uh, here's the main uh, Capitol building uh, taken from uh, uh, position in the gardens. You can see the, these lovely. Uh, with the symmetry of the building itself, which resembles the United States Capitol building with its uh, uh, chambered wings uh, to the left and the right and a central cupola. Uh, but here we have much more extensive uh, works here with marble staircases and fountains and uh, lots of lamps. Uh, this is the dome uh, of the cupola here. I just want you to take note of the uh, really uh, unparalleled uh, artwork uh, turn of the century artwork here. Uh, it really is a treasure trove of art. Uh, notice the gold leaf everywhere. Uh, <laughs> here's again one of the uh, legislative, uh, uh, I think this is actually only a committee chamber if I remember right. Again, just take a look at the turn of the century art there. Uh, the gold leaf, the mahogany desks, uh, the leather. Uh, pretty nice uh, stuff. Looks more like a uh, late 18th century uh, royal palace uh, than it does a uh, publicly funded and publicly owned legislative legislative uh, chamber. What kept the machine on track? Why did people put up with all this for so long? Well, it's business friendly. You know, uh, people got a job as long as money keeps flowing. Uh, workers have jobs. The factory owners are happy. The workers are kind of happy that they're getting a paycheck. Uh, there are 25,000 jobs uh, that are allocated through the spoil system. That's to say, as long as your political party stays in power, you will keep your public sector job. But if the other party gets in, you will lose your other public your public sector job to someone appointed by the other party. And so that keeps people motivated, radically motivated at a grassroots level to keep the machine ticking over. You don't want to lose your job. As I said, 25,000 jobs probably represents the incomes that supported more like 125,000 people. There are memories of the Civil War uh, and Democratic Southerners, a dislike of the white supremacy platform of the Democratic Party, uh, which, which keeps the, the Democrats almost unelectable well, effectively unelectable uh, throughout the period. Uh, employers uh, could access through public channels uh, how their employees voted, which meant that if employers were happy with the machine and they told their employees to vote in a certain way, employees were always afraid to go against them for fear somebody would check. Beneficiaries in the machines, 25,000 jobs, are constantly desperate to campaign to the Republican Party in a way that it was hard to motivate people to go out and and uh, campaign door to door Democrats. Uh, ordinary people suffered, no doubt, under the machine, uh, but not maybe not uh, worse than they suffered in other parts uh, of the Union. Uh, there was a high degree of organization 
even if there were some really outrageous scandals uh, and some terrible uh, public downsides. And the reality is that while ordinary people suffered, the democratic al alternative just seemed unthinkable. Keep in mind, this lecture is very long at an hour and uh, 15 minutes, but the other lecture is short at under 30 minutes. So the two lectures for this week should total up at about uh, a usual uh, two hours or so of lecture on the week. Thank you.